Hey guys, Drifter here. I just discovered that a group of French scientists forced guinea pigs to listen to Adele for seven days straight, and the results are disturbing. Scientists weren't just testing whether or not guinea pigs like to listen to someone like you or hello. Rather, they were testing the effects of compressed music on our ear health and function. Adele was just the artist they happened to choose as a control. The results of the study were that the guinea pigs who listened to Adele when overcompressed suffered significant damage to their ears, whereas the guinea pigs that listened to uncompressed Adele showed no damage whatsoever. This result flies in the face of pretty much all current audio safety theories, guidelines, and recommendations. And it's important to you because the vast majority of teleconferencing softwares artificially compress audio to try to drown out noise. Almost all modern music is compressed and some genres are frequently overcompressed. TV and radio broadcasts also frequently use compression to get that loudness that people want. And I have to admit it, the audio files on Reddit were right. I'll never hear the end of it admitting that Redditors were right. So the scientists wanted to test out if non-Gaussian sounds are safe, and they had a pretty straightforward experimental setup. The scientists in France rented a music hall, they got some big speakers, and exposed guinea pigs to a single song from Adele uh, at 102 decibels for four hours. And while I wish they could have put the guinea pigs in cute little uh, headsets, this was just played from normal speakers nearby. One group of guinea pigs was exposed to Adele in her natural uncompressed form, while another group of guinea pigs were exposed to deliberately overcompressed audio of the same song from Adele. And it's important to note that both groups listened to the songs at the exact same volume. And then scientists decided to measure the changes going on inside the guinea pigs' ears based on which group they were in. And by measured, I'd like to point out the scientific paper says that some had to be sacrificed, which in scientific terms means that they were put down humanely and then biopsied so we could see what was going on. So today we're going to dive into this experiment, its effects on the guinea pigs, and offer some advice on how you can protect your ears from being damaged by compressed audio. So the first thing we want to talk about today is what is compressed audio? Well, compressed audio is audio that has undergone dynamic range compression in the mixing process. When I first covered this scientific article in short form content, I made the mistake of confusing it with file size compression. So what the scientists were studying was not MP3s or MP3 compression or wave versus flac or anything like that. Rather, they were talking about dynamic range compression, which reduces the difference between the loudest and quietest parts of an audio signal, essentially splashing the volume range, making quieter sounds louder and louder sounds quiet to get a more consistent sound, which is what a lot of people like, but it's a little bit hard to visualize, so let's give you an example. The quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog, and the rain in Spain stays mainly on the plains. Pause. Um, we'll make this audio bigger so that you can see it more clearly. And let's go ahead and zoom in a little. So I've zoomed in on the audio and made it a little bit bigger so it's easier to see. That's lossless. That's uncompressed. That's uh, raw, whatever you want to call it. No problems for the ears. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab this little section of audio here, go to my tools, and FX actually, and we're going to go to compressor. And I preset this for a pretty aggressive compression, so we're just gonna hit OK. But in this example, you can see what compressed audio looks like, what it's doing. You can especially see these parts here in the middle uh, where it doesn't have these quiet pauses or breaks between what I'm saying very often. It just kind of continually outputs a certain volume of noise. And again, I wanna clarify that this type of audio manipulation is extremely common in almost every form of media. If you're listening to a radio host, a podcaster with a mix amp, they're probably compressing their audio. Artists do it all the time to make their music louder as a part of the loudness wars, which is a video almost should be its own different topic, but is essentially an almost unspoken rule or contest between artists to compress their music more and more to make it louder and louder and louder and punchier on low fidelity systems and things like that. But let's talk about what is normal and safe listening. Most normal safe listening guidelines use what's called the equal energy rule. I'm gonna grossly oversimplify the equal energy rule, but it basically postulates that your ears receive damage based on the total amount of energy from the sound waves. And it's used in a type of logic such that the louder the sound, the less time you can be safely exposed to it. 
Conversely, the more quiet the sound, the longer amount of time you can be exposed to it. So for example, a quiet sound over eight hours, like a water droplet dripping on the sink and keeping you awake at night, will have the same energy as a jackhammer being run for 20 seconds. They'll deal the same amount of damage to your ears because one's insanely loud in a burst and the other one is a consistent noise. That's a very extreme example, but I wanted to drive the point home. And the problem with this theory, which OSHA uses and international organizations uses and everybody uses to create their noise safety guidelines, is that it has only ever been tested using natural sounds. And most of the time they're testing these natural sounds, it's construction equipment, it's heavy machinery, it's things that still exist in the real world kind of banging into each other. But it's never been tested on electronically generated sounds, which takes us into the theory behind this experiment. The scientists in the paper define these unnatural electronically generated sounds as non-Gaussian, whereas normal natural sounds from objects interacting are called Gaussian sounds. Gaussian would mean that it's a natural sound that almost always occurs in a normal distribution or a basic sine wave and it looks very common, what you would expect from a piece of audio. A non-Gaussian sound would be pretty much anything that does not have a normal distribution and is not operating on a simple sine wave. Uh, there aren't many non-Gaussian sounds in nature, but electronic synthesizers, editing software, noise removal software, and tons of other digital devices can produce them quite easily. The scientists of this paper wanted to see if the equal energy rule for hearing damage still applied to these unnatural non-Gaussian sounds because it had previously only ever been tested with regular Gaussian sounds that can be generated from the physical environment with one exception that they found and wanted to mention. The authors of the paper said, quote, exceptions to the equal energy hypothesis have been examined only in particular cases when the statistical properties of sound waves deviate considerably from the Gaussian distribution due to the presence of very high level transients, such as those found in impact and firearm noises. So just basically studying guns has been the one little exception to this rule. In the results section, I'm mostly going to be quoting the paper because they say things better than I could ever hope to. Here we go. Conversely, middle ear strength behaved differently as the group exposed to original music had fully recovered one day after exposure, whereas the group exposed to overcompressed music remained stuck to about 50% of baseline even after seven days. And continuing, it says, quote, but compression caused more lasting damage to the middle ear's stapedius muscle, which contracts to protect the inner ear from loud noises. At just one millimeter long, it is the smallest skeletal muscle in the body. And continuing the quote after skipping a less relevant paragraph or two, quote, subsamples, uh, we were talking about subsamples of the guinea pigs, were then re-exposed to the same music as the first time and sacrificed for density measurements of inner hair cell synapses. No difference in the synaptic density was found compared to unexposed controls with either type of music. The present result shows that the same piece of music, harmless when played in its original version, induces a protracted deficit of one auditory neural pathway when overcompressed at the same level. The induced disorder, however, does not appear to involve inner hair cell synapses. And the TLDR for this is that it's quite bad for your ears, or at a bare minimum, it's worse for you than regular audio. So what does this mean for you? Unfortunately, this means that you are constantly being exposed to non-Gaussian audio that can damage neural pathways and or muscles in your inner ears. Scientists more specifically define it as, quote, the disorder involves decreased strength of the middle ear muscle reflex. And as I stated before, compressed audio is extremely common in almost any form of auditory media. Off the top of my head, music genres that uh, tend to be more compressed are any form of electronic music, synth music, clubhousey kind of stuff, some types of rock. Uh, a lot of pop music actually gets pretty heavy compression as well. Television shows frequently compress their audio along with radio broadcasts and commercials. Even regular old teleconferencing equipment like webcams have built-in compression for the audio because people seem to prefer it. And videos on pretty much any social media platform stand a chance of being compressed because some people are going to compress their audio before uploading and other people are going to have microphones that have built-in compression. You just run into this 
everywhere, every day. So me, you, and everybody else is being constantly exposed to a type of audio signal that will damage our ears worse than regular loud audio, which is wild. Uh, compressed audio is also something that people seem to prefer, which makes it more popular than regular audio in some circumstances. And I guarantee you that it'll take years or decades for companies to adapt their products to this new scientific information. Like this study just came out, right? So if customers prefer compressed music and there's only one study saying it's bad, I guarantee you corporations and government regulators are gonna let people keep buying and selling the compressed audio they want regardless of what happens to their ears. And now I just have to be more particular about it. And to be clear, this is something you can't really avoid. Buying a new type of headset, buying a new type of speaker, listening in a different environment, uh, you just, you're gonna run into this all the time everywhere. It's just something you fully can't control. And the study does have a couple of unknowns. The first unknown is how much compression is necessary to cause this damage. Scientists didn't test stair-stepping compression to see where the damage ended. They just did uncompressed and extremely compressed. There's also a question of how loud a person can listen to this compressed music before they receive this damage. There's a chance you could overcompress the music and the damage doesn't start until a certain decibel range. Or what the relationship between these two things is. Maybe compression mean the more you compress it, the more quiet you have to listen to it. I don't exactly know. And of course, it hasn't been tested on humans yet. Just guinea pigs because they're very similar to humans. But that's all for this video. I just think that this is information that you all should know so that you can protect your hearing because that's very important for you. If you enjoyed this video, if you learned something useful, don't forget to like, favorite, and subscribe. Drifter out.